so glad you're here. I'm so happy that we got uh, this many people to come out for cake and punch and hear Pastor Perry preach. That's, for all, that's why you're all really here, right? So, so glad that you are here this morning. Why don't we stand and join our voices together and sing our opening hymn. Thank you so much, Lord, that you have called us together as the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus' sacrifice and all that you have done for us. Father, we just ask that you would just be with us in this time. Be with Pastor Perry as he brings us your word. Be with the choirs, the musicians, Lord, and all that participate in this service for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are blessed with the return of our sanctuary choir.
God's word. Our readings come from Romans chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and Matthew chapter 28. Romans chapter 10, verse, beginning at verse 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. Second Corinthians chapter four, beginning in verse one. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We, know his, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear to our great power, or that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. The Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Jam, bring this little light of mine.
Racing, all right. A grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you today on the installation for David and I have to say for Dana and Alexi, the whole family. Uh, your mom's name? And Diane. And Diane. So we've got David, Dana. I'm sorry? Uh -huh. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So David, Dana, and Diane. So, got the D thing going there. That's kind of cool. Also, Don. Nice. All right. Whew, that's going to be tough. All right. Well, it's good to be with you. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Pastor Perry Fruling, I'm over at Bethel Lutheran Church, which is on Highway 21 down the road. We're very excited for you because uh, I can't remember how long it is ago that I met with the call committee, maybe 15 months ago and talk, talking about uh, how things would go forward for your congregation. And then, you know, there was a, it, I, I can't remember exactly if this was a precipitating factor, but somebody stole my um, identity and uh, I, uh, the people were sending out uh, texts in my name and, hey, send me some uh, credit cards or things like that. And so I had to send a text to everybody in my phone, about 900 or thousand contacts or something like that and David was one of those and he responded hey how's it going you know something like that after he received it which I got you know several of those back and uh, we got to talking and um, at, from that point on and you you can't blame me and you, and you can't blame me but uh, from that conversation uh, God began to move in David and Dana's life about the possibility of, of coming here so very excited um, David and I got to know each other during uh, uh, my time working with LCMC, uh, the parent organization, well, I can't say parent organization, but our association that we have uh, nearly a thousand churches that we associate with. So uh, David, uh, great with conflict resolution, he was on team that we had. Uh, that doesn't mean you'll never have a conflict, by the way. It just means that uh, you have some tools uh, of how to resolve conflict. Uh, just like any good marriage, uh, you're going to have some conflicts, but the idea is, is how do we work together for the the glory of the gospel in this place. And that's where I want to start because the passage of scripture that I want to use uh, is one that Dana read just a little bit ago. And let me just give you a little bit of highlights. Uh, for the God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts uh, so we could uh, know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile jars of clay containing the this great treasure and this makes clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves I I think that's a passage of scripture I need to read every day uh, maybe every hour if I'm going to uh, be a, a pastor who uh, gives glory to God regularly in my life because it's it's very difficult when you are a spiritual leader in a congregation uh, to not sort of lose sight of what it means to be a pastor who has this humility. So I had that very passage of scripture at the bottom of my emails for like five years or something when I worked with LCMC. We have this treasure in jars of clay to remind us that the great power belongs to God and not to us. Because it's really easy when you lead in some way to forget the humility that God calls us to. Now, we live in a culture, in a time that is more self-centered than ever. Um, a recent poll of, uh, of young people, college student age, found that uh, they are the, the uh, most narcissistic uh, group of, of that age people has been since they began the polling how many, you know, dozens of years ago. And purchases by Americans now are more self-centered than any time in American history. So how do we live in the kingdom of this world in which we have to uh, buy and sell and, and eat and drink and do the things that we do in the world? How do we then be the church, the kingdom of Christ, 
in that kind of a world. <laughs> It's, it's a challenge, and that's why I say maybe every day I need, it makes it clear that the great power belongs to God and not from us, that we have this treasure in jars of clay. So where do we begin with all of this? Well, I love the story uh, that uh, Peter Gregg tells in, in his book, um, we got to remember the, the Vision and the Vow, about a distinguished art critic who is looking at a piece of, of Renaissance art by a, a painter named Filipino Lippi. And uh, he was looking at this, this painting in the London Art Gallery. As he was looking at the painting, uh, he couldn't help but recognize something was wrong. Uh, his skill, his composition, his color was, was phenomenal. But there had been something that had troubled art critics for years about, about this painting. It had Mary holding the baby Jesus and two saints, uh, Dominic and Jerome, standing near her. But the, 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 something was off with the perspective. Uh, as, as Jerome and, and uh, Dominic stood by, it looked like they were you know, for, in the foreground. Uh, the, the mountains behind them looked like they were going to topple forward. Mary seemed to be looking downward rather than outward. And this art critic, whose name is Robert Cummings, may have not been the first to criticize it, but he was probably the last to ever criticize this painting because he had a revelation as he was there in the London Art Gallery. And his revelation was this, is that this painting had never, was never intended for an art gallery. It was intended for a place of prayer. And so right there in the art, London Art Gallery, he fell to his knees and he began to look up at the painting. Now the perspective had changed. Now Barry was looking right down at him. The uh, saints seemed to recede in the background. The hills uh, recede to their proper perspective. He realized the perspective wasn't the paint. Problem wasn't the painting. The problem was his perspective and the perspective of those who looked at the painting. Robert Cumming, the art critic, saw, uh, was able to see something as a person of prayer that Robert Cumming, the art critic, can never see. When we begin our work as the body of Christ, it begins with humility and prayer on our knees. I love the uh, song by uh, Phil Wickham, which I have on my playlist. Uh, it's called The, uh, the Battle Belongs uh, to You. And he says, when I fight, I fight on my knees. Uh, oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Too often, we want to fight battles ourselves. And of course, you know, I'm guilty of this. I go running headlong into the next new great thing, wanting to do ministry to reach people for Christ. And you know, God blesses that. But I tend to think it works a lot better when I just say, God, in prayer, will you lead us where we are going? We have this treasure in jars of clay. Pastors, any leaders, what maybe you at work, wherever you are a Christian and you are a leader, whether in your own household with your children or on, if your kids on the playground with others or in your classes, wherever it might be, when you lead, how do you lead with humility? Well, there's a, uh, a guy in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, his name is Solomon, and uh, Solomon in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 decided to take a swan dive off the deep end of the gra self-gratification pool. Uh, he says, I'm going to go all in on the self-fulfilled life, and it explains it in, in uh, chapter 2 of, of, of Ecclesiastes. And so here we have this Solomon, one of the wisest men who ever lived, outside to Jesus, maybe the, the wisest man who ever lived. But he wanted to discover what is life all about and how can I be fulfilled. So he decided to build all kinds of houses, Ecclesiastes 2 says. And when, when that wasn't enough, uh, he decided uh, to take a, a, a binge in, in planting vineyards. It says he planted, uh, planted gardens. He planted all kinds of flowers. Uh, when that wasn't enough, he decided to buy slaves and huge herds of livestock to impress all of his friends. 
Jesus. And then he decided to amass silver and gold. And we know that Solomon was one of the richest men who ever lived. Then he acquired men and women singers. He didn't just go to you know, iTunes. He actually bought rock bands and brought them to the palace. And, and then uh, he bought a harem. And I don't even know how to comment on that, actually. Uh, only if he gave them all credit cards. That would have been transcendently expensive. But um, for, and thank you for smiling a little bit. The people at Bethlehem. They don't laugh at my jokes very much. So you can make me really feel good by laughing very loudly today. Um, finally, he said this. He said, I decided to de deny myself nothing that my eyes desired. The all-American dream. To have the opportunity to have the resources to be able to deny yourself nothing. And so he says, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. Here's the richest guy in the world, shoots for the self-gratification uh, championship, and it's a total bust. Now, just hold that thought for a moment, and I want you to uh, come over here with me for a moment. I brought along today a, uh, a basin and uh, a towel, and uh, this is hopefully to give us a little visual picture of another biblical uh, character in another situation. It was uh, on the eve before Jesus died, and most of us know the story pretty well, but um, Jesus tells the disciples to get uh, a room, it's the upper room, uh, the disciples get it, and when they get there, um, you know, as people would have it in these sorts of uh, gatherings, uh, they usually, you know, get food all made and gathered, and then they hire a foot washer guy, uh, uh, the Bible says doulos, a servant in, in Greek, uh, doulos, and uh, he actually uh, is paid, or that's his slave job, is to get down on his hands and, and feet and wash uh, the, the disciples or anybody's feet. And the reason for that is, is all the streets were dusty that day, kind of like your parking lot out here, by the way. Last time, I, I think the first time I came here, it was heavy rain and I sloshed through some water. Uh, today it's nice and dry and I appreciate that better. But the idea here is that it, their feet were dusty. And when they would get to uh, the table, they would actually lie down. And so my feet are in the face of the person next to me. And so that, we're told as uh, in, in scripture, that day uh, somebody forgot to hire the dishwasher or the uh, foot washer guy. And as he, uh, uh, as they get there, uh, they sit down to eat. Actually, the Bible says they actually sat down to eat because uh, no one would lower themselves to do the job. The disciples are all going like, this is below me, I'm not gonna do this. And uh, the next guy says, I'm not doing it either. I don't know who forgot to get the, uh, uh, the foot washer guy, but it's not gonna be me. And so there's this awkward moment, you know, where nobody gets up to do it, and the food comes. And I, I, you know, I remember once when our family was having uh, uh, supper at, at home, and I, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but um, you know, a couple of the kids were grabbing for something, and the bowl with uh, potato chips went flying off the table. And there was this awkward moment where they kind of look at each other, mom and dad kind of look at each other, you know, not my job to go down and pick up all those chips. But there was one in the family who was very excited about it. It was the dog, and he came rushing over, and now we're all jumping out there, and we're all going after the potato chips to try to stop him, right? But you kind of get the idea that at that moment, the disciples, there was this awkwardness. There was this sense that I'm not doing this, and I don't care if we don't get our feet washed. So the food comes, and they eat, and after dinner, Jesus, the Bible tells us, takes off his outer garment as a slave would do. He gets down on his knees, you know, ties uh, around his waist, he gets down on his knees and begins to wash the disciples' feet. Imagine the embarrassment, you know, when Jesus comes around and he takes the towel and he white washes their feet. And of course, Peter, as we know, says, not me. And Jesus says, well, you can't have any part of me if you don't let me wash you. And so he washes their feet and there is this transcendent moment for the history of all Christianity, where we get a picture into not only who Jesus is 
as the savior of the world in his humility, but what he calls us to be as his followers. And so it's in the middle of a, a culture that is so self-absorbent, in the midst of a, a world that really is about me and how can I advance, I think of pastors coming into that, and, and we're given authority, and you're going to hear today, authority to preach and to teach and to administer the sacraments and, and to, you know, to pray, and the authority, uh, stand in front of you, authority to forgive sins. And how do I use that authority? It would be so easy as a pastor to use that for myself to administer the grace when I feel it's okay to administer it, to love others when I want to love, uh, to, to lead the way I want to lead, to do the things I want to do. But really we are called into a relationship with each other where both church and pastor, it's really about taking up the towel about us saying, I'll be the servant. I love the song that you guys sang earlier, that I see you acknowledging, remembering the words already, about the servant heartedness of what it means to be a leader. The passage of scripture also that Dan read uh, talked about how beautiful are the feet of those who bear good news in Romans chapter 10. They're beautiful when they are washed clean by our Savior, the forgiveness of his grace. And when we choose to kneel before others and declare their sins are also forgiven, it's only good if it is good news. It is only good if it's the gospel and not judgment. And uh, it's only hope if the grace and light of the brokenness we encounter is part of our own journey to let people know I am broken. So David, this is the beginning of what I believe and hope will be a, a great new uh, era at Bible Lutheran Church. This is the opportunity for Bible Lutheran Church to uh, begin anew. You guys have had a wonderful history of, you know, all the way back to Jerusalem Lutheran to Ebenezer which I live about three miles from, and it's, uh, I've walked out there, I've just, you know, walked the dogs out there, and I, I just realized the history of the, the passion for Christ that brought this group of people here because of the gospel of Jesus Christ that differentiated them from the, uh, the Salzburger neighbors that said, we want to stand for the gospel, and that's the hope that now again we get to begin passionately proclaiming to neighborhoods that are growing up all around you, uh, to this growing county. Uh, you are perfectly positioned for God to do great things, but it only happens when we take up the towel. When together humbly we walk with one another, we wash one another's feet, proclaiming grace and forgiveness, shining up beautiful feet that can bear good news because the only way they can bear it is to be forgiven and, and nurtured. So my prayer for you is that you will have beautiful feet, that your feet will be cleansed by Christ and forgiveness and by one another as you work together and walk together in the gospel in this place. Let's close with prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, I thank you for the good news of your grace, and I thank you, Lord, uh, for taking up the towel in a way, God, that has brought us uh, the hope that we could not have without your humility and your uh, perfect love and grace that uh, went to the cross for us and forgave our sins uh, so that we might live forever with you. And uh, that our job in this side of heaven is to love and proclaim you as Lord of all. So will you uh, bring this congregation and this pastor and his family together uh, that your love might be proclaimed in a way, God, that light shines here, as the scripture said, but very clear that we are jars of clay and that the glory belongs to you and not to us. Thank you, Lord, for that. Bless us as we uh, install David today. May your light shine in our midst. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 I think we sing a hymn, Jesus paid it all. So do we stand? Okay.
David Harold Steer, our co-worker in the gospel as lead pastor, I now ask for certification of this call. Our Lord Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Paul wrote to Timothy, set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devout yourself, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preach and to, te and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through the prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Preserve in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Thank you, Andy and Richard. I'm going to invite David forward 
and um, let's begin this service. Uh, Pastor David Steer, in the presence of this congregation, I ask you, will you preach and teach in accordance with the Holy Scriptures and the confessions of the Lutheran Church? I will, with God's help. Will you love, serve, and pray for God's people? Will you nourish them with the word and the holy sacraments, leading them by your own example in the use of the means of grace in faithful service and holy living? I will, with God's help. Will you give faithful witness in the world that God's love may be known in all that you do? I will, with God's help. May Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Amen. And now you, the people of Bible Lutheran Church, will you receive this messenger of Jesus Christ, sent by God to serve God's people with the gospel of hope and salvation? Will you regard him as a servant of Christ and a steward of the mysteries of God? The office of lead pastor is now committed to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with every good, uh, good work that you may do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. As you come up, if you can't reach David, just put your hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you. And, and why don't, uh, if you're still seated out there, standing out there, why don't you uh, also just place your hand out in front of you as a sign of laying on hands of David at this time. So I'll begin the prayers and others who want to join in, if that sounds okay. Shall we do that? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks by the power of your Holy Spirit that you have brought David and Bethel, I'm sorry, Bible Lutheran Church together today. And I pray, O oh God, that you would enrich David in his serving. Uh, by your power, O oh God, give him wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge in the fear of the Lord, and joy in your presence. Uh, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be, please be with Pastor David Steer as he uh, leads this church and uh, makes stewards of all of us and uh, leads us all towards Christ. Holy Spirit, we ask as a church that we continue to love, cherish, and be with the Steer family as they minister to us and to others in our midst. Father in heaven, we give you thanks that you raise up 
sons and daughters to lead your congregations as you desire for us to move forward in mission. Now we pray that for both Bible Lutheran and for David, your Holy Spirit will be leading them, guiding them, that uh, as they worship, as they minister in your name, as they uh, receive your grace, O oh God, um, may your light shine in this place. And as they walk together with servants' hearts, uh, will you, O oh God, uh, give them the, the heart of a servant that they might be able to serve well together as the body of Christ in this place. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for bringing us together in this place. And now we pray together the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. family and he said I will you'll I'll bless you and you'll have a family 
And so we started the process after a long conversation with many other pastors and, and Christian leaders and family members. And Dana and I said, okay, this is where God is leading us. We had lots of support, as I shared with you when I was here in April, from the immediate family, but a lot of people were really worried. And about a week, and Dana will correct me, but about a week after we accepted our call to the very first church to be the youth pastor, a seven-year journey of trying to have children was blessed. And after we said, yes, Lord, we will follow, no matter how scary it is, God said, well done, my child, and he blessed Dana. We had not one, but two children in 10 months and a day. <laughs> and fast forward to my very first weekend that was planned for my very first church. Some of you have heard some of the challenges. There was a tropical storm, a house that didn't sell not once, not twice, but three times up in Illinois. Uh, there have been some challenges finding the houses down here. That's nothing compared to my very first call. The Friday night before the, hey, come meet the pastor celebration and the, the, the huge dinner and all of that, I was in a car accident that put me in a wheelchair for three months. It took me over six months to learn how to walk again. So needless to say, they had their celebration without me. I started about a month later, and I was at that time Mr. Sports and Mr. Activity, and that was what I knew, and that's what I was going to be as a youth pastor, and God said, no. He said, I'm going to take all that away. What you have is sufficient. You have me, and you have the ability to build relationships. That wheelchair was the best thing that could have ever happened to me in my journey of ministry because I had to fully rely on God, and I had to fully rely on building those relationships. Some of you have seen the fruit of those relationships, people that have come and visited in the last months that I've been here. Next week, we get to baptize a little baby for a couple that live in Brunswick, and they've been making the drive up here. Her, uh, the, the, the mama, she's from my church back up in Illinois. My first church in uh, Michigan, I have a young man that I still mentor and we talk almost every other week and several other students do it. So God showed me the importance of relationship. And I tell you all of that background, one, to encourage you that if you feel like you've taken a wrong turn, Jonah is not the only one that went in the wrong direction before God straightened him out. It's never too late to turn and say, yes, Lord. And I share that information with you as a pledge to you that while there's all this great stuff that we get to do from preaching and the sacrament and reaching out to others, my earnest goal and my pledge to you is to be your friend in Christ and to get to know you as best I can and as much as you let me. So with that, we'll close uh, this portion of our celebration as I said, just the Cliff Notes or the Sparks Notes version of my call. Over the next years, you'll hear much of it, and probably at some point you'll be able to repeat it word for word on how Pastor Dave got called and how Pastor Dave ended up. And as Perry told you, it was just, uh, I got his text and I was driving, and I, so I did, wasn't going to text while driving. And I called him up and said, hey, Perry, how's it going? And we chit-chatted for a while, and one thing led to another, and then I talked to Richard, and then I talked to my wife wife and she didn't say no <laughs> and then we told mom and mom is like oh yes <laughs> so God has been working and he's been working through each and every one of you and I covet your prayers they don't end today um, I ask that you continue to pray as we go forward in this ministry so I would ask if you are able why don't you stand you know give us the benediction and then we'll sing our closing song how great is our God <laughs> May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And friends, share that hope every day and every chance you get. Let's lift our voices and sing together, and then we'll pray for the refreshments afterwards.
because of the things that you have done for us, Lord, but because of who you are. Father, we ask that you would bless each and every one of us as we, we leave this place, that we would take not just your greatness with us, but your love and share it with our neighbors, Lord. Father, we ask that you would just bless the refreshments that we are about to have, our conversations together, and Lord, we thank you for all the hands that have made this possible. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you all over in the hall. Thank <laughs> you.